another place, another time. Touching many hearts along the way. Hoping that I'll never have to say it's just an illusion. Feelings get you down. Open your eyes and look around. It's just an illusion. Just an illusion now. Could it be a picture in my mind? Never sure exactly what I'll find. Only in my dreams I turn you on. For just a moment, then you're gone. It's just an illusion. 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 Could it be that it's just an illusion? Put in me. Just an illusion now. Now could it be that it's just an illusion putting me back in all this confusion? Could it be that it's just an illusion? Just an illusion putting me back in all this confusion. Could it be that it's just an illusion?
Ladies and gentlemen, the session is starting. Please proceed to the ballroom and take your seats. Thank you.
Africa has a history of foreign military interventions dating back to the colonial era. The 21st century has seen an intensification of foreign and intra-African military intervention. The reasons include competition and the desire to make humanitarian concerns, peacekeeping, and sometimes a push for regime change. How can military intervention be avoided by better mechanisms of conflict resolution? Do foreign military interventions work? Are they compliant with the international law or are they a violation of African country sovereignty? How can the involvement of Western countries become more beneficial to the continent's peace-seeking agenda? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Zainab Badawi, Director of Kush Communications. Well, hello. Good afternoon. Nice to be with uh, all of you. Michelle, if you, uh, I will sit here. So if you sit next, you sit next to me here. And uh, Peter, Alessandro, and uh, Michelle. So hello. I hope you all had a very, very good lunch. I had a delicious one. Yes, I know. Wonderful uh, Moroccan hospitality and Moroccan um, great talent in making delicious food. It's, it's a combination that cannot fail. So you saw some questions there that were set out in that video, and that's what I and my esteemed panel are going to try to do in this session, is to try to answer some of the uh, taxing questions about lessons learned from military, foreign military interventions uh, in Africa. To say because there will be an opportunity for all of you to um, put your points, comments, or indeed ask questions of our audience. I'm going to start straight away um, with this uh, lady sitting here to my right. Michelle Ndai is originally from Senegal, but she's currently living in Addis Ababa, where she's director of the Africa program at the Institute for Peace and Security Studies. Um, she's a woman who's really had a great deal of experience um, both domestically and also in the international arena on matters uh, African and um, is very, very highly respected. Wonderful to see um, you, you today with us, Michelle. So, Michelle, just set the scene for us initially. What exactly do we mean by foreign military interventions? Because um, just looking at recent history, and let's not go too far back, maybe focus um, on the last, uh, I don't know, 25 years or so, um, by different motives. Um, let me just first say, um, and I would, would like really to, to set the tone for this, this conversation uh, about military intervention and go back to the, a little bit, if you allow me, to the principle. Uh, I think um, um, foreign military intervention or inter-Africa uh, military intervention are needed in, such a, in a certain circumstances. And um, I don't need to dwell on the list why um, they are needed. It might be for uh, conflict de-escalation. Uh, at a certain point in time, when you have violent conflict, you need uh, military intervention. So during the case where uh, peace has to be maintained uh, and there is uh, human rights abusers. And so for different reasons, you're saying to stop a, a, to a stop live a, conflict, a, life a hot conflict. conflict. Hot conflict. Sometimes you go in issues. for peacekeeping, humanitarian Arian issues, issues um, violations of, of human rights. Of human rights. Right. But and also I, terror is a lot of things, isn't it? It's People, a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. But what I would like to say first is that maintaining global peace is a global responsibility. And uh, we should not dissociate having military intervention and inter-Africa intervention, if you look at it, because the mandate of uh, actually mounting a peace support operation or a, uh, or a military intervention is a mandate of the United Nations and the Chapter 7 when it comes to a coalition of country, or and the Chapter 8 when to a regional organization like ECOWAS or the African Union sometime uh, when it comes to the case right. of, of, of AMISM. So that's given us a good I overview. Peter Farm, Peter is... Um, a vice president of the Atlantic Council based in the United States is also director of the um, 
Africa program in the um, Atlantic Council. And again, somebody who has written or edited or contributed to numerous hundreds of, uh, of publications, um, articles and so on about Africa. So Peter, Michelle there saying that there are different reasons why we might have foreign military interventions. Uh, we also have different actors at play. Sometimes it's fellow African states, sometimes it's Western nations, sometimes it's under the auspices of the United Nations. Um, does that all make a difference in terms of legality? Maybe if you give us an overview on when foreign military intervention national law and when they're not? Certainly. Let me take a step back sure. and, and to, just to complement everything that Michelle just said. I think there's another way of looking at it, which is looking at the circumstances, not what the intervention is aiming to do, but the circumstances. There are circumstances where the state in question simply needs assistance because it's facing a threat that it had not or anticipated or simply is beyond its capacity to do so. Then there are instances where the state in question uh, is itself the perpetrator of the problem. And then there are cases where the state in question exists only as a juridical fiction, that we pretend it exists, but in fact, the state is dissolved. A good case of the latter would be Somalia uh, for the international community recognized over time 14, 15 different governments, but not one of them really was a government by common sense definition and had no control of territory, no governance, and very little local legitimacy. But uh, so I think we should also add that to the taxonomy. Mm. As far as legality, of course, in the ideal cases, Michelle, it out, you have a case where you have uh, the host government, if it is capable of doing so, wanting assistance. You have the regional and, uh, uh, body echoing that, the African Union supporting it, and authorization perhaps under a chapter seven at least, or possibly chapter six of the United Nations uh, Charter. That's the ideal case. But I think there are also cases where you could potentially, even without the consent of the state in question, uh, they're perceived as legitimate by the international community and of course uh, who are protected in cases where we're talking about uh, the right to protect uh, or in grave humanitarian circumstances where quite simply the state has dissolved. Mm. Okay, I mean, one, one example from a few years ago, I suppose, is when President Julius Nereri of Tanzania went into neighboring Uganda to um, remove Idi Amin from power, and, and that was something which technically w was an intervention, not sanctioned by the international community, but was certainly welcomed by both the people of Uganda and Africa and further afield. Michel Duclos, Duclos uh, is a senior, um, former senior French diplomat. Um, he's served as ambassador in various countries, including um, important ones, the ambassador for uh, France at the United Nations. Again, somebody who has had, you know, four decades of experience um, working um, with Africa and um, brings a great deal of knowledge to this topic and is also currently director of the um, Institute Montaigne based in Paris, which is a think tank. Um, Michel, so um, France obviously is a country which we have seen both in past and more recent history that is given to military interventions um, in Africa, you know, most recently, for example, in Mali, we've seen in the past in Ivory Coast and other countries. Just what are the principles, would you say, that have governed French military interventions in the last uh, few decades in Africa? Then I... <clears throat> Maybe I will start uh, by, by saying that we are not addicted to... Uh, I didn't say you're addicted. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh. My guess, in the, uh, given the, 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 st the current state of the debate in France, is that we can avoid to uh, get involved in a new military <coughs> intervention. We'll do it, of course. But to answer your question, I would say that uh, there has been uh, an evolution uh, uh, some, some years ago, we were still in a post-colonial uh, mood when uh, we used to intervene uh, to make good uh, and very often to protect our friends in, the, in, 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 in a given country. Um, but there were two, two specific uh, motivations. Uh, which I must say have uh, very with uh, the, the colonial past. 
which was first the uh, uh, responsibility to protect, and that was Libya, and, uh, and secondly, counterterrorism, and that was uh, Mali. In both cases, of course, we were very keen to have a UN mandate, that is to say, to operate in a legal environment, uh, which was uh, perfectly right. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of uh, Libya, uh, there was uh, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, bad feeling uh, in some quarters of the community because uh, we were under the criticism that we abused the mandate of the UN. Uh, we think that it's not the case, of course, but, but there there is a debate. I think that in the, in the case of, of Mali, Mali it, it is uh, accepted that uh, we did uh, the right thing at the right moment. Okay, thank you. Um, Alessandro Minuto, Minuto Rizzo, you are um, Italian and you're a former uh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, serving from 2001 to 2008 under George Robertson when he was Secretary General. And you're currently in charge of the NATO Defence College Foundation based in Rome. But staying within the confines of the African context and um, perhaps not taking us to Afghanistan and all the rest of it, um, is there anything you'd like to add to the kind of taxonomy that we've been, you know, looking at in terms of um, the different forms of military interventions? Well, I think I would like to try to, 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 to enlarge the debate into uh, some kind of, I mean, non-descriptive uh, interfashion. In the sense that if you reflect, I have done some time, about <clears throat> military interventions, then I think that overall uh, the success is not at all assured. On the contrary, it's always very doubtful. And you ask why. Uh, it's perhaps very useful and very uh, productive in the beginning, and then somewhere it stops, I don't know, something happens. In all cases? Not in all cases. It's very difficult to go in all the... You know, there are very different cases. But I would say in average, even what is happening in Sahel today, I would say, you know, that you have this French operation in the beginning, Serval, very useful in the moment of emergency. It seemed everything was done. Then now, two years later, we discover, no, it's not done. Uh, you have Al-Qaeda in various parts of the country. Local governments are very weak, so you really wonder what to do. The international community has to, co to cooperate more, to do more. Uh, but I think that perhaps if you go at the, you know, at the center of the, of, the, of the issue is that in fact a military intervention is meant to occupy territory in the end is meant to uh, resolve a problem somewhere it has a geographical definition but you know this in the end you are dealing with uh, problems created by people which is different from geography to my, my mind uh, but what is the use of the military instrument and to win hearts and minds of the people. All right, okay. I mean. So you've right, kind of taken us rather a, a bit forward about the effectiveness of uh, military intervention, but just um, sticking with this topic of, you know, the reasons why um, people may want to go into um, Africa, um, foreign military interventions, let me just see what the audience think. We've got a question, which is, in terms of um, interventions in Africa by Western forces, um, be they France or, or whatever, D does the audience feel that this is a bit of an overhang from the colonial era? era? Western foreign, you know, Western military interventions in Africa. Is this an overhang of the colonial era? So, do I see, yeah, there's the question. You know how to um, say yes, no sometimes, don't you? You know how to vote, you've been doing it. Does the result come up? No? Let's just see a show of hands. Who thinks, yes, that it is an over a hangover from the colonial era? So, oh, yeah. a very small number. No, Who, oh, the, there we go. Yes, 40%. No, 40%. Sometimes, 20%. <laughs> <laughs> is that 40 and 40? Yeah. yeah. This is like the Rosetta Stone. I can hardly see it. Yeah. But yes, that's very interesting. Hmm. Even. And uh, 20 something. So, um, were you surprised by the result that 
it's seen as um, a hangover from the colonial era. Um, Michelle, I'm looking at you. <laughs> what do you think? Are colonial you, power. Uh, yes, as, as one of the former major colonial powers in Africa. Do you, do you find that, question, that answer surprising? No, I, uh, I think that it's clear that uh, if France went to, to Mali, for instance, it was both because we, we have uh, uh, an indirect interest, uh, security interest, and also because we feel more responsibility than uh, elsewhere. So, of uh, the, the colonial uh, inheritance. Maybe it's not the, the determining factor, but it's one factor among others. It's clear that in Libya, we had no um, colonial past with this country. No, that was your country. But anyway, <laughs> yes, we won't go there. Uh, yes, you want to come in, Peter? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the part of that is, I think, the, why the, the high percentage of yes answers or sometimes, if you add those two together. Yeah. I think part of it is the tendency, and this is, I think, a, an error that we make, and it's not just in Africa that we, as an international community, make this mistake, but I think there are other parts of the world one could point to, is when we intervene, it's not just an intervention to stop mass atrocities or to stop winners and losers. And it's that picking of winners and losers that, can e that I think causes two problems. One is it creates this impression of neo-colonialism, and two, it actually stunts local political dialogue, discussion, and undermines actually the legitimacy of whoever is the perceived or picked winner, and therefore actually the sustainability of the actual uh, results of the intervention itself. So they become almost another party to the conflict. Yes. Taking sides. Michelle. I think I would like to, to uh, look at it from another perspective. I, I believe that there is um, an issue of perception um, that we haven't dealt with. The perception that some of the intervention are um, post-colonial um, driven or led. Second perception that we haven't dealt with for me is about what is being done by the African Union in terms of Africa, African-led uh, I'll come to that in a minute, but just to finish this, this issue of the, of the um, you know, perception of it as being a, an instrument of neo colonialism. I mean, Michelle said that sometimes they go in, you know, for humanitarian reasons and because of historical connections with the country out of um, altruistic concern. Perhaps it would have been good to have this survey done in the countries where um, you have a former colonial power. Why? What do you mean by it? that? That it's well, not we, welcome well, by the, the people. Well, the result would have been different. I, I think. In, in what the, way? In, in the case of Mali, for example, that Michelle mentioned, I do believe that uh, where the African Union could not get its its its, um, its act together, and it was necessary. Of course, recall again that maintaining peace is a global responsibility, right. and France going into it have <coughs> helped the, the escalation of the conflict. All right. But at the, at, the, at the end of the day, I think the hangover to a force, uh, an international force, an African force, would have, I think, given more legitimacy than sure. having the Barkhan continuing to be an occupied force seen by the Malian. And I think that's where um, um, where the discussion where the should be, is. and the perception But is. are you being a bit unfair, though, to Michelle, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. um, if you take Sierra Leone, for example, the United Kingdom, when Tony Blair was prime minister, went in because of the terrible atrocities that were going on by the revolution united at the time, who led the British um, in Sierra Leone, General David Richards. You know, he's had streets So the people really did welcome that military intervention. So sometimes it is done with a higher purpose in mind. I yeah. do agree with okay. that. Well. I think when Nigeria went into Liberia, it was the same, but it was an African-led yeah. and uh, well-perceived. Right. I think the legitimacy issue is what we're dealing, is, we're dealing okay. with. Is there a suspicion sometimes that uh, Western powers are carrying out these military interventions because of their own mercantile interests? Is that, is that something uh, that is? I, I, I note an interesting uh, development, um, uh, uh, listening to Michelle. In fact, there is something, yes, belonging to the tradition of the colonial past, of course, certain countries like France, 
listening to that part of the world. On the other hand, we see uh, this phenomenon changing because uh, now uh, I think there is a perception, a threat perception in Europe, uh, thinking, which is raising over the years, thinking that in fact we have a threat from the South independently of, you know, colonial past, etc., etc., And so there is more uh, of a demand of cooperation and the will of cooperation by countries, uh, because um, now you have also small European Union, uh, sort of no, not really military, almost military missions, uh, controlling elections. I was struck to, to read on the newspapers yesterday coming here that Italy has decided to send the battalion to Niger of all things, uh, never happened before in the history mm -hmm. of Niger. Why? Because Sahel is supposed to be a threat because of migration, the illicit mm -hmm. traffic, terrorism, and all those towards the reason, which I think is a good thing in itself. So you think that, do you think we're going to see more military interventions in Africa because obviously a whole source of um, migrants into Europe is from Africa, and that therefore people will want to ensure that the aren't reasons of conflict why people are fleeing. I think so. I right. think that you're right. But of course, if you allow me to add something more to go a little bit beyond that, you know, the issue is that uh, when you, you have to intervene militarily, then you have to do something afterwards. Uh, otherwise, you don't solve the crisis. Oh, yeah. You have a history behind sure. that. You cannot solve the crisis only by military means. We will ask that, yeah. We will, we will address that later, Alessandro, towards the end of our discussion. So, Michelle, you overhang and so on. You raised the issue of um, foreign interventions in African countries by fellow Africans, whether it's sanctioned by the African Union or not. Is well, it more acceptable? I think it's not a, a, about um, being acceptable or not. I think the African Union has taken a stand a um, couple of years ago uh, in 2002 to move <laughs> from the principles of uh, um, non-indifference to the principles of um, uh, non-interference -inter to the principle of non-indifference. And I think that norm normative shift has been quite important in the way we perceive uh, military intervention in by fellow African in other Africa, through the African peace and security architecture, which is accepted. And this is the norm today. But again, the mandate has to come from the United Nations under Chapter 8 or Chapter 6. Right. So this is quite, I think this is the, uh, important to, to note. The second issue when it comes to African, um, uh, uh, fellow African countries moving into another country, it's also driven sometimes by national interest. It's driven by the same um, uh, factors that I mentioned mm -hmm. that pushes countries to intervene or right. coalition of countries to intervene. But we still have also in Africa our regional hegemons that would like sometime to make sure that the country next door will not have a spillover into my, conf uh, sure. into my country. So those are the type of um, issues that we're dealing with. But the normative issue of the African Union, and it's quite qualified, clear, and it is being followed currently. All right. And I think one key example of a couple of examples. Okay. Yeah, just okay. So that if he gets <laughs> a chance okay. to speak. But <laughs> That's okay. If, if he hasn't given the examples that you wanted to give, <laughs> I'll come back to you. So, okay. Peter Farm, we have had some examples there of um, interventions in, in. We've got. Uh, give us some examples of interventions in Africa which have been done not under the auspices of the regional, you know, like ECOMOG monitoring groups. We've had Kenya going to Somalia, we've had Ethiopia going to Somalia. We've had Senegal go into the Gambia more recently. So perhaps just unpick some of the ones that have caught your eye for us. Well, sir, uh, sir what's interesting, even in uh, operations, now Kenya, I would argue, in 2011, had legitimate right. national security interests uh, in intervening in Somalia. They, right. they were getting terror, a terrorist coming across the border. They were having flows of refuge. But what's interesting, as, as Michelle was saying, the normative architecture that's come into place is subsequently to that, the Kenyan defense forces that were in Saudi were brought in under the umbrella of AMISOM, the African Union mission in Somalia. Uh, the Ethiopian forces that went into Somalia, and one can debate that's a separate parenthetical, I should uh, intervene in Saudi for their own national security reasons, uh, ultimately were also brought under that umbrella. So it's, it's very interesting that... But they went in just of they, their own accord they went in, in their December own accord. 2011, wasn't 12, it? They went in yeah. under their own accord yeah. for very clear reasons. I want to debate those reasons. Are 
the view in, from Addis Ababa was for national security reasons of their own national security interests. Mm -hmm. uh, but subsequently, the, the, the norm in Africa is that, that they have now accepted this principle that they had to regularize the situation somehow mm -hmm. In, uh... So is that what's happening there? So for example, when we saw more recently, just a year or so ago, when Senegal, uh, Senegalese troops went into the Gambia because um, Yahya Jame was refusing to accept the results of the um, election that awarded the, the, the victory to um, Adam Abaro, that was welcomed, wasn't it, um, by, by the world, really? Yes, and it's all, and, but, you know, it also was a very unique case. Uh, and it, in the sense that, of course, we all know the geography of the Gambia, surrounded on three sides by Senegal, a very small a sliver of a country. It was a very unique case. What would be much more compelling would be a case where that wasn't the case, where the African countries felt the necessity to intervene in a similar standoff, because we have a number of, shall we say, abortive transitions going on across the continent. That would be, to me, the, the watershed mark right. uh, in, in many respects. Gentlemen to my left, I mean, uh, do you think that when it comes to military interventions by fellow African states in Africa, be it because of their own concerns about their national security, like in Kenya and, uh, and Ethiopia and Somalia, or to uphold um, democratic rule, as in the case of Senegal going into the Gambia, do you think that that is in the West, and do you see a Western um, role as being what, a supportive one in terms of helping provide funding or all the rest of it? I, I think that um, the, the decision makers in, uh, in Europe, at least in our countries, are aware that uh, there is a, a sensitive issue and that uh, the former colonial powers has to be very cautious uh, when they are involved in the security matters in, in Africa. Uh, that's why we, we tend to support, to use your word, uh, more uh, capacity building for the regional organization, organizations uh, than I must also give another illustration of that which is that under uh, President Sarkozy's uh, mandate, we renegotiated rene uh, the range of our bilateral defense agreements with a lot with all our former um, uh, colonies in Africa, so, so as to make clear that we, we will not intervene for domestic reasons, that is to say, it's not part of our bilateral relations that we should come uh, to protect a government which would have a position. So um, I think that our governments are more and more cautious, more and more aware of the realities, and we put in our uh, new uh, bilateral uh, treaties uh, very clearly that no, we won't come simply because we are asked to come. We need an international mandate and, and we need a motivation which is linked to, to, to things which are accepted by the international community. Right, okay. Well, Any, yes, sorry, do you, Alessandro? Yes, well, I think that uh, um, the direction should be very much, as already Michel was uh, outlining, towards an empowerment of the African Union. I mean, I think there is no alternative to that. And uh, we have still, I think, an African Union which is rather weak. I mean, the missions are implemented that direction. So it's improving, but still very weak. And so your question was if uh, other countries should help. And the answer is certainly they should help. Because one thing is to be, you know, having uh, under your name, you know, an operation in a country, which may sound very aggressive. And another thing is to support a legitimate international organization like the African Union and to give the entire support, technical support that we have. And we have a lot of knowledge. Uh, I take NATO, but I take also the European Union. We have a lot of knowledge also from a multilateral point of view. 
Uh, for instance, there is a NATO cell, I was told the other day, in the Secretariat in Addis Ababa with the African Union. They want to empower that uh, just in order to, 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 to support those operations. I think things will be very, very much better in that mm. way. Uh, some questions. While I'm taking these questions, can we ask you a question? Do you think that military interventions in Africa are more acceptable if they are carried out by fellow African nations? So are military interventions more acceptable if carried out by fellow African nations? Yes or no? So if you could uh, press your buttons for that. And I'll take um, one, two, three. So the gentleman there at the back and then, yeah. And if you stand and introduce yourself and your organization if relevant. Please, sir. My name is Ludishki. I'm from OCP Center. Uh, I think military intervention from uh, non-African uh, nations sometimes is welcomed. I, we were in the Security Council when the resolution was adopted, and if it was not the military intervention by France, there was a lot of reluctance from the United States, for example, but if it wasn't the decision of the French to go militarily, I think that we would have been in a worse situation than the one that we are contemplating now. One. Secondly, sometimes it is unavoidable from regional powers to intervene militarily. Because first, if you have to wait for, for the troops to come. Secondly, the immediate intervention by regional uh, uh, has an immediate impact on the situation. Now I come to the necessary intervention. When we switch from the, Afri from the OAU to the African Union, we switch from non-intervention to non-indifference, meaning that when you have uh, 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 violation of human rights that amount to crimes against humanity, genocide, there is a responsibility from Africans and from worldwide nations to intervene in order to stop right. these uh, violations. Can I just ask you a question then? Just before you sit down, sir, so yes. we've got two countries at the moment in Africa where we're seeing the most against civilians, South which is in chaos, the Democratic Republic of the Congo as yeah. well. Would you like to see some regional military intervention or, or African military interventions in both of these countries? Well, if you want to make an intervention first, you cannot do it without the authorization of the Security Council. And if you want to make the intervention, you have first to make the determination that the situation is equated to a threat to peace and security. And you can guess the controversy that can okay. be established right. in the Security thank Council. We'll see what our panel say about that. Yes, if you uh, could stand and make uh, Yes, your... thank you, Karim from OCP Policy Center. Uh, it's assessment about how it is viewed by populations, because this is central to this discussion. And second, uh, coming from the work of, of central banks, where we've come the long way to reduce the discretionary component of monetary policy. Uh, here, there is too much discretion in the decisions. Uh, do you think we can come to a framework that is a sort of, uh, you know, has conditions for interventions, that is clearer and accepted by the international community? Because it is that discretion, that leeway that politicians keep that creates a problem of perceptions within population and this sort of, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's not clear. And so do you think globally we are ready to tie a little bit our hands a little bit more for less? Dis Excellent, thank you, yes. My name is Adam Agai, I am from Senegal. I'm a former director of information of ECOWAS. I'm a journalist. My question is for the gentleman of France. I don't know if he's uh, following me. Yes, he is. He's writing it down. Okay. Uh, the, I have a two-pronged question. The first one is, you said that uh, France has uh, uh, started revising or has already revised 
its uh, bilateral defense agreement with uh, its former colonies. Uh, in some countries like mine, we were a bit upset that this was done in a discretionary way. And people are asking, why can't you put it out in the public domain? It's because we need to know what is therein. Uh, at a time when we are talking of let's uh, build our independence and uh, foreign powers hands off, do, do you think it was right for France to call African countries to come for an African summit on security in France, led by France. Is it something that you believe in the 21st century France should be doing? I thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Let's Mr. take the first, I'll come back to you. Let's take the, the one, uh, I'll take the first question as a comment, which was uh, very well received, thank you. But the question from Karim, I think I'll come to you on that, Michelle. So what do the people of Africa think about these interventions? And then the second point, which perhaps Peter or one of you could address is, should we have a, a, a framework drawn up by, by the global community that um, sets out what the, um, mm. what, what the so what are the people of Africa saying? Well, I think Karim has actually pointed out um, an important question, which is um, the issue of the mandate. Uh, who provides the mandate and what is within the mandate? Um, and I think um, the, the short survey has already given us the response that oh, yeah. in Africa today, it's very clear that African uh, uh, countries, but also the population in general, would welcome an African-led um, yeah, I should just say the result is 63%, 62. 62. 62.15% say um, a military intervention is more acceptable if carried out by fellow African nations, and 37.938% call it say no. Yeah. So a very clear majority there saying it's more acceptable. Yeah. Exactly. And I think um, what Karim is pointing out to is also the fact that um, in, in in providing the mandate was in the Peace and Security Council, the Security Council of the, 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 the United Nations, um, the uh, perceived domination of certain countries who would like some time to take the lead uh, to solve their own issues is one of the key, the mm. key, issue, key problem today. And I think unless we solve that, that discretionary uh, process that we have where uh, some of the country can take the lead uh, because of the veto power and decide on military intervention. The case of Libya is one of a, a very clear where the African Union had a solution on the, on the table proposed to the Security Council but not, has not been, been taken. And the coalition, the NATO coalition went in. I think it's also looking at the mandate but also uh, what um, what is important is what the, the regional organization have um, um, as solution that need to be explored. And I'm not saying it's always perfect. There's right. some um, uh, issues that need to be dealt with sure. within the, the, those our, regional organizations. Our first, our first and intervention from the floor says it takes months and months to get in here through <laughs> the United Nations. Um, I don't know either you gentlemen or, or you, Peter, you know, we do have the responsibility to protect under the United Nations, which came in at the wake of the uh, Rwanda genocide, saying you can go in and violate a country's sovereignty if it is <coughs> that country. But that, that, that of course, is the, the answer to the, to the question about uh, criteria. It seems to me that there will always be an element of uh, discretion in the, in the final decision. When you go or not go, to help or to intervene into a country. I think this is something that um, one has to, to keep in mind. You know, we, we, we usually talk about the, the fog of war, but there is also a fog of crisis and a fog of diplomacy. I mean, when Sarkozy made the decision to uh, intervene in Libya, in, uh, in uh, Libya, yes, of course, he had uh, something like 24 hours to make a decision. Mm. He did not know, he, he didn't have all the data. And probably this is an extreme case. In the case of Mali, we had been following the situation for months and maybe for years. So we had a better uh, view of what was happening and we were in a better position uh, to, to make a decision, but at the end, it's up to the president sure. to decide or not. Okay. Having said that, 
uh, the, the uh, international uh, consensus and a set of criteria was devised in uh, 2005 at the UN summit where the uh, responsibility to protect I say this is a sad uh, fact of that, that we had not made any headways in the common consensus, the consensus around that. On the contrary, now we are in a worse position than we were uh, 15 years ago, because precisely things uh, were implemented in a way uh, which uh, created uh, disagreements and, uh, and less consensus uh, inside the international right. community. Okay. I haven't forgotten about the t direct question that has been put to you, Michelle, uh, but I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. I'll just see if on the, uh, these two earlier yeah. points, Peter and Alessandro, yeah. Peter first and then Alessandro, and you have three minutes left and there are still some benches okay. on the floor. So you just keep it tight. Thank you. I, <laughs> just for, very quickly, uh, just as we've discussed the necessity for legitimacy of, the, of any intervention on the part of the population affected, we have to also be cognizant in the real world in which uh, that we can't have mathematical certainty or some sort of algorithm to determine intervention. It also has to be legitimate in the countries that would provide the troops, that provide the resources. And in order to achieve that political legitimacy there, there has to be that room of, for discussion, that room for discretion, that room for socialization of the reasons for, whether those reasons be humanitarian, national interests, or otherwise. Because without their, that legitimacy on the part of the, if you will, the donor to the, uh, to the piece, get to the question of the legitimacy on the recipient end. Right. Alessandro? Well, in a shorthand fashion, because this is something you can discuss for hours, I mean, the legitimacy of uh, uh, yeah, military you're right, intervention in a foreign hours. country, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you have it for the night. But in a yeah. shorthand, I would say unilateral interventions are very bad. So I'm very critical, for instance, personally with the French intervention in Libya. I think it was a disaster, joined by Britain, by the way. So there were two countries. It, was, it has been, a, 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 we saw, and we see the consequences now. Uh, on the other hand, if you have UN mandated, I think it's the maximum you can have. I simplify very much, of course, again. And of course, the regional organization, uh, the African Union is again is the best, and it acts by consensus. So if you have the persons who are this, I think this is the best case, and it should be going more and more in that direction, mm -hmm. in my view. And uh, we should really try to support more and be much more decisive in requesting help and support, even technical support from at the external world. Mm. I mean, I have to say, I know it's not in Africa, but Kosovo under Clinton, when Clinton went into Kosovo, not mandated by the United Nations, was seen as, as a good thing. So it does vary. It didn't work in Libya, but it has in Kosovo. Um, oh, sorry, no. So just very quickly, Michelle, on you know, greater transparency with the new policy from Emmanuel Macron, and was it right that he should invite African presidents to a security conference on security in France? No, on the first question, I have no answer because I don't know enough about the subject. And the second question is very simple. As a diplomat, I'm very sensitive to, uh, politi to, 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 reason, to political symbols. Uh, but in the same time, sometimes you have to be efficient. And the meeting in, in Paris was with uh, Chancellor Merkel and representatives from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and countries of the Gulf to extract from them uh, money. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, you can have a bilateral so later, gentlemen. Maybe, maybe okay. it was better to do it in Paris in order to get okay. the, the right financing of the operation, rather than not do it at all. Okay. Yeah, but maybe have a bilateral. In it, you're talking about Saudi Arabia recently to help out the G5 summit. No, two years ago, something like that, France convened a summit of African heads of state to discuss security. 
it is not acceptable. That's the principle right. I'm raising. Okay, fine. Thank you can pick that up in, in here. Okay, so we've got very little time and panel, and I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hands. Oh. I can go. Th yeah, that wow. I can go through all of you, but do keep your comments very, very quick. We haven't heard from a lady, so I'm going to go to this lady and then to Obi. Uh, maybe Obi first, because the microphone's nearer. To Obi Ezekiel Weasley. No, th there, oh. behind you, behind you. And this lady, oh, sorry, I didn't see you as well, uh, Madame Asia, and there. Okay, yeah, well, briefly. Yes, thank you, uh, <laughs> Zainab. Yeah. I'd just like to know what you think um, differentiates the Syrian situation and the Libyan situation. No, 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 because okay. we're discussing Africa. Okay, yeah. Why is it that okay. Syria... We'll, we'll, Did we'll, not get into we'll get a quick answer from Michel on that yes. since he was a former ambassador in Syria <laughs> to uh, this Madame Asia here. Thank you. Well, just a very quick question about the title itself of the session. Beyond the aspects that you have been discussing of legality, legitimacy, and so forth, what about the main lesson that the Libyan intervention taught us? What about the day after? Okay. Which is never catered. We'll have that for. as our last question. That's great. That's the final point. Um, it's really asking the military interventions work, the lessons. Yes. Um, merci. Uh, J'ai posé ma question en français. Donc. Et je crois que la question d'accepter ces interventions étrangères ou pas dépend de la ponctualité ou de la durabilité. Une action ponctuelle d'une puissance étrangère pour parer à une situation urgente, elle est acceptée. Mais quand ça a tendance à, à durer, je crois que les populations commencent à, 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 à ne pas accepter. Et donc, et, et toute la question est là. Est-ce que dans ces interventions des puissances, le civil qui développe et qui démocratise peut tout de suite prendre la place du militaire qui est détruit. The fellow non-French speaker to give a quick... Uh, what he just said to fellow non-French speakers. Uh, I think they all... Did you all understand? understand? Well, yes. Do you no. want to just sum up what he said? No, I, I, yes. Well, it's, it's, it's a bit the same uh, thing as the uh, previous remark. Okay. That is to say, the question is not so much about intervention, but about post-intervention yeah. and the length okay. of the military presence the following the intervention. We'll is, it, is, it, is it wise to stay too long? Okay, we'll come to that, yeah. Um, okay, how many on this side? Yeah. Wow. Okay, let's just go through you quickly and then I will, uh, yes? Um, just, and then just hand the microphone around. Patrick Worms, are we not being too binary? We have a taxonomy where on the one side we decide to intervene militar militarily, and then we have another taxonomy of things where we decide not to occur, for example. Many, in, for many of the communities, the state is not perceived as a legitimate actor, but as a stationary bandit, to use Fukuyama's words, people who intervene by asking for bribes. That is what leads to the insecurity that makes it possible for an Ansar Din to come in and say, I will provide justice. How yeah. can we intervene before military intervention becomes necessary in order to change the governance and preclude military intervention? Well, well okay, preemptive action there, just behind you. Some of these are comments, panel, but if you can't remember them all, I'll prompt you and then you can answer them in your final comments. Yes. Yes, hi, I'm Vemba Dizole from uh, Johns Hopkins University. I just want to, to react quickly to the premise of this discussion. Uh, one is all interventions are not created equal. Some of the interventions are military attacks. Rwanda attacked the neighbors. Those are military interventions welcomed by the population. Uh, two, the assumption that the AU is a workable organization is beyond me because the AU does not have the capacity to deal with these kind of issues. They've shown that over and over. They have not been decisive. They don't have the means. And then three is the UN. The UN is part of the problem. In the places like the DRC, the UN is going on 20 years. That's a type of military intervention that is no longer, and has been barely welcomed by the people. Okay. This is the case in CAR as well. Okay. So just to challenge you on those premises. Thank That's you. fine. We'll take that as a comment. It's very well judged. I mean, you talk about Rwanda going into the DRC. I mean, at one point in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there were 11 African countries with military presence there. Oh, yes, you've got the microphone. Yes, young lady. Yes. Um, 
Esther, I'm French, and I wanted to come back to the comment that you asked uh, with the first question. This is colonial hangover, our intervention is colonial hangover. I think that for France, it's very much about power. Uh, one of the elements of power is economic. France is stepping down. It increases its interventions in Africa as a way to maintain its power on the global stage. And I think that it's very much perceived by its allies. When France accepts as one Western country to intervene in Africa, that's also because other Western countries don't want to do it, but say there needs to be a Western power there. And for France, it's become a bargaining tool regarding its other allies, Western allies. And when you travel to France, might be a secondary power when it comes to economic, but in terms of military power, that justifies its seat as the Security Council. Right. Going to the gentleman to your left. Thank you, sir. William Zarpin from SAIS. The uh, unitary uh, single country intervention has a unity of command, be it be Nigerian or French, and a responsibility. A multi country intervention has many different, com almost competing units and often unsavory behavior. How can the AU intervention be cleaned up? Okay, thank you. We've got two more, and then that's it. Yep. I am Landry Signier, uh, a uh, senior fellow at the OCP Policy Center. So my question is the following one. We speak about uh, the uh, preference of African interventions. Uh, the gap that we are having is the capability uh, question. Who is uh, fun funding those uh, interventions? Where are the weapons coming from? Uh, where are security forces even being trained? So how can we have an effective uh, African force uh, without uh, being able to friend it? Thank you. That links into the question just previous to you. And then two more, and then we'll call it a day. Yeah. OK. Um, I'm Gilles Abi from WATI, West Africa Citizen Think Tank, informally with ICG, International Crisis Group. Um, I think one, of, one interesting question could be what lessons uh, should be learned from Western intervention in other parts of the world for Africa. I'm thinking specifically armed drones. And as a citizen of West Africa, I'm actually quite concerned by the recent decision by the US to uh, use armed drones out of Niger. And actually, France also announced some months ago that they will be doing the same thing probably next year. Uh, so the question is, you know, are we sure that something that has not been so successful in other parts of the world uh, will be successful in, in West Africa. And actually, it can be very counterproductive. Uh, so again, even someone from the US, uh, former US diplomat just wrote an article two days ago to say that it is a bad idea. So no public debate in West Africa, no parliamentary debates. And you know, how do you, what's your opinion on this, on this issue? What's the exact question? What? The use of drones. All oh, right, use of drones. OK, thank you. And home. then, yeah, final one there. Alors, euh, moi, je suis très surpris que, de, que je n'ai pas entendu quelqu'un euh, parmi les intervenants euh, du bilan des interventions. Ça fait les, euh, les interventions militaires en Afrique ne sont pas nouvelles, Colouésie, etc. Et là, euh, on est aujourd'hui peut-être face à une des interventions les plus importantes, notamment celle, celle au Mali. Et, et ma question est comment se fait-il que, euh, que la communauté internationale ait expérimenté euh, beaucoup d'interventions militaires et dans le cas du Mali, dont, euh, et, euh, dont le problème est très connu, c'est un problème politique, cette intervention n'a pas été précédée ou accompagnée par un processus politique euh, qui pouvait, euh, notre, euh, un processus politique pour euh, renforcer, le, le, la, la, le, légitimer l'État. Okay. Euh, et euh, de, de, ma question, l'intérêt de ma question euh, se trouve dans et là, nous sommes dans une situation où le Burkina Faso est touché, le Tchad est touché, euh, le, 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 et, et on sait très bien que le, le, la question du, de, du Mali n'est pas euh, euh, historiquement une question d'islamisme de, de, ou de djihadisme, c'est d'abord une question de, de cohabitation ethnique, de, de, de construction de l'État-nation, etc., de, de, de système politique légitime ou pas. La, le même problème se posera un jour en Mauritanie, même si on règle le problème de, de, du Mali. Il se posera au Tchad, il se posera au Niger. Yeah. Comment se fait-il qu'on qu continue à avoir des, des interventions militaires sans penser les processus politiques pour euh, au moins dégager des, des, des pouvoirs okay. fondés sur des consensus majoritaires euh, plus, euh, forts voilà. Thank you. Just give us a brief summary of what he just said for those who don't speak French, please, Michel. The question. Um, why don't we think more about the uh, political processes?
the focus of the ministry. Okay, so we, we've had a collection of some very nice questions. Panel, just keep them very short. Michelle, I'll come to you very quickly. Obi's question, the difference between Libya and Syria, briefly. Well, I disagree with Alessandro on, on <laughs> Libya because I'm, uh, I must say, one of the last strong uh, defender of uh, our intervention in Libya. Okay. Because uh, knowing what's happening and following very closely what's happening, what happened in Syria, I can tell you that had we let uh, Gaddafi in place in Libya, we would have today in Libya a situation similar to Syria. My that Libya is certainly is certainly uh, a chaotic situation or anarchic situation. The number of dead people uh, uh, a year is without any comparison with the massacres in, in Syria. So yes, in Libya uh, we were able to reduce uh, the uh, number uh, to, 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 to save a, a lot of lives. Okay. All right. We also had a, a couple of questions which are all along the same lines of how one can strengthen the African Union to um, lead a, have a more effective role in terms of um, interventions and also capacity building and, you know, that the United States, that the United Nations has reduced the United Nations Peacekeeping Fund by something like six, six or seven hundred million dollars. Um, so a great deal of concern that we're going to see, um, you know, less effectiveness from that department. But maybe you, Michelle, on that point? Well, two, two, two very quick uh, points. Um, the first one for me is legitimacy. And the tendency today is more and more um, African-led uh, uh, military intervention. Uh, through the African peace and security architecture. And I do believe that uh, 10 years down the line when the architecture was uh, um, launched, there has been a number of progress in terms of uh, making sure that um, the provision of security is currently done by African themselves. For mm -hmm. me, that's the, the first issue. The you and know, the architecture has yeah, do a number it of tools, it worse. Yeah. a number of tools that helps for preventive diplomacy, but also early warning. And everything is not rosy, but I, but I do believe that there has been a trend in making sure that the architecture is operational, despite the difficulties that uh, member state was the sovereignty issues hanging very, very uh, strongly on uh, the, the, the development of the, the, of the architecture. The second uh, point I want to make is about funding. I think, um, as I said earlier, um, most of the, 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 the uh, military intervention are being uh, um, um, are happening in Africa, 80% of them of the United Nations. So funding become critical in the way that if the African Union wants to take the burden to be able to fund part of those, those uh, peace, peace operations. And it is happening currently through the Kaberuka report and the new, repo, uh, new reform that is being launched at the African Union where 25% of peace support operation, cost of peace support will be funding by, by, mm -hmm. funded by African countries okay. themselves. Peter Farm, there was one point about the use of drones by the United States um, as a form of military intervention and um, anything else you care to okay. pick up. But we'll keep the question about lessons learned for the very end. Yes. Okay. Uh, drones, like everything else we've been discussing here, are tools. And it's how they're used, the context in which they're used, and the operational command. And I think. Professor uh, Zartman's comment as well here, as who is in command and who has these things. I think, and so we can't, you know, it's a technology, it's neutral. It's how it's used, what type of intelligence is fed into it, and of course, inevitably, the consequences of erroneous judgment. I think those are the most important things, rather than to demonize any tool, whether that tool be intervention, whether that tool be a specific platform, like drones, armed or unarmed, or whatever. I think much more important is the of, of legitimacy, accountability, and, and ultimately the decision-making process. Okay, before I come to your final, uh, Alessandro, yes. Yes, well, <coughs> I would like us to make a, a, an aside comment. We are speaking all the time about legitimacy, what is right, what is wrong. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry to disagree with my friend, uh, Michel. I mean, I find it difficult to understand why the president 
authority to bomb a country out of his own convictions about the local situation. I don't know, but this is, you know, and all that is not the first time that we describe. The point is concerning the, 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 the African, uh, the fragility of the African state and the fragility of the African armies, because it is not enough to speak about legitimacy, you have also to speak about the tools that you have. So we say the French, they should not do that, and then, okay, well, but who is able to do that? replacing the French, the Sahelians, the Nigerians, you have to, to improve their armed forces and they are not able to do that today. So there is a huge problem there uh, mm -hmm. about uh, uh, defense expenditure and uh, defense reform in Africa. Oh. I just put a, a very small example. At one point in time when I was at NATO, the uh, representative of, you, of the Secretary General of the United Nations came to see me to ask if NATO, Liberia, he was working in Liberia, representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations, and he said that with the uh, what they like to do. Right. Just going to ask the audience, final point. We've talked about, you know, the effectiveness of military interventions and the criteria and so on and so forth, but who believes that military interventions are part of the solution to a problem in a country? Yes or no? Who thinks that military interventions foreign military interventions are a solution yes or no <laughs> and while you're voting on that let's just have the final comment from our audience which is the lessons of military interventions you know can foreign military interventions work can they create a climate whereby you have sustainable you know democratic institutions and democracy and respect for human rights and all the rest of it so i will go in this order michelle well, then I, I would tell you my, my personal feeling. I, I, I don't know what my, my, my authority think about it, but my personal feeling is that we are at the end of a cycle. That is to say, uh, you'll see less and less foreign military intervention as such anywhere in the world, but especially in Africa, uh, for a variety of reasons for domestic reasons in Europe, that is to say uh, our public opinion are not ready to accept more uh, uh, big intervention. And also because uh, the populace. now our problem is to face day-to-day -day, uh, jihadism and the spread of the uh, jihadism in this region. And for that, you need governance, you need uh, judges, you, you need uh, rule of law more than soldiers. Right, okay. If you could just keep your answers uh, briefly. So the trend is fewer and fewer, that's another part of the answer. Well, you know, I think that we have a lot of experience behind us, so it is rather easy, to my mind, I mean, to give answers to this very important question. It is very clear that the military instrument may be necessary at a certain point of a crisis. I don't deny that it is not really going to solve the crisis. You need something else. So you need to have a military part and then a <coughs> civilian part. A step beyond that is that in our societies and even in our the stage of our international cooperation, it's rather easy to use the military instrument. <coughs> you push the button, you give the order, the troops will go in every country of the world. But it's much more difficult to use civilian part. Development aid to send judges there, rule of law, as Michelle is saying, you know, all these things are much more difficult to achieve. And so you, res you go much more to the military instrument than you should, just because the other part is lacking. And that is where we should concentrate our efforts if you want to have really some good result in the end. So it's, it's part of the solution, necessary but not sufficient? Absolutely. Okay, so. all right, thank Underline. you. Michelle? Well, I, I believe that, uh, uh, as Michelle era, where there will be a less, less military intervention in Africa. It's going to be African-led, and we have learned our lesson, as the lessons, I think, uh, more and more, was having a strong mandate from the United Nations and being able to mobilize uh, some of the um, coalition of countries that have the capabilities to respond to crisis in a timely manner. Let's just remember that we are in an era where we have never faced such a security threats unprecedented security threat. We need flexibility, we need to be, we need adaptability, we need funding, to mobilize funding internally, and we need to be able to respond to those threats in a timely manner. Final word, Peter Farm. Well, I think the, 
what militaries are good for, and but, but some Africans as well, professional forces are good for carrying out a specific mission, short-term duration, clearing out a space, give them a specific target, and the military won't struggle, but they'll do it. But beyond that, as our my fellow panelists said, you need all those other elements. They can clear a space, not just geographic space, but political and social space. That needs to be filled with something. Mm -hmm. And until that is filled, and it has to be filled from a process that is acceptable within us, as we said earlier, otherwise you just pick your winner and try to impose it. The case of Somalia being a one example, the sacrifices of African peacekeepers, Ugandan, Burundian, for the better part of a decade, cleared a political space. We have really yet to see the Somali government, in quotation marks, fill that space with the necessary governance and other institutions that would prevent a resurgence that of Shabaab back to where they were in the status anti quo. So we need that those capabilities, civilian capabilities, both on the part of those who would intervene and upon those who would assume that space. Because without that, we will just perpetuate a cycle and return again. Thank you very much indeed. So in this discussion of um, foreign military interventions, the military is all about conflicts and people fighting and so on and so forth. But I think that there's clear harmony and um, agreement between our panelists and our audience that um, military interventions are part of the solution necessary but not sufficient. When I asked that question, there was an overwhelming response that military interventions are part of the solution. 85% of you said yes and only 15% said no. So on that uh, cordial note, I thank my panel. I thank you for your attention and for your interventions. It's been my pleasure to be with you. See you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep your seats. The AD talk will start immediately. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Uduak Amimo from Citizen TV. Hello again, good afternoon. So we'll get started. Please take your seats. Uh, Adama, please, thank you. Um, please take your seats. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you again, uh, moderating this um, AD talk on building South-South partnerships for development and security. Um, it continues uh, the trend of the conversations we've been having um, and I hope that we can elicit a bit more um, in terms of um, how we see South-South cooperation going. So I'll introduce my panel, starting with Eniola uh, Maffe. Um, she is the Partnerships and Business Development Manager at the Foundation for Partnership Initiatives in the Niger Delta. Lionel Zinzu, the former Prime Minister of Benin, is now the chairperson of the Paris-based think tank Terra Nova. Good afternoon and welcome. So look, as I was saying, there is a trend uh, building up um, through the uh, conversations we've been having at this year's um, uh, Atlantic uh, Dialogues, and this is a big conversation to have in just uh, 30 minutes. Um, this morning's focus on security, we've just been hearing Zenab and her panel talking about um, foreign mili uh, military interventions, and you might recall yesterday that when unscientifically polled, um, the feeling from most of you here was that Africa should go it alone. Um, but you'll also be familiar with the saying that goes something like this, no continent is an island. So cooperate we must. And so I'll start with you, Eniola, given you work, how do you have these conversations? Thank you, Adorak. Um, from my perspective, it's more, I'm, I will speak from a, the ground up uh, as a practitioner in trying to create partnerships between different entities in, li in alignment with uh, many of the cooperations that we're talking about within the South-South cooperation. I find that fundamentally there's about three areas that would be the kind of fundamental pieces of South-South of cooperation that would be a good tool. Uh, since South-South cooperation is a significant tool in the kind of toolbox of, of, of our work, 
Um, one is that it has to increase physical connectivity um, between the countries, between the actors, both non, uh, state and non-state actors, um, and ensure the 2063 agenda, 2063, 2063 yeah. agenda, um, the, the essence is continuity both from the supranational to the national and domesticating. And that brings me to the third piece, which is the domestication of the whole process. How do entities within those countries um, take the frameworks and build that into doing um, in their particular countries or in the issue areas? Okay, so Lionel, I'll come to you because we hear a lot about South-South cooperation. Um, we've been talking about foreign military interventions. But what do we mean when we talk about South-South engagements? What, what sort of um, collaborations are falling into this basket? First, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I think that first and foremost, we have to remember, and, and more and more in terms of security, uh, Africa rely on itself. Uh, Africa is funding the essential part of its own development. I would add that uh, Continental integration is an essential engine to progress development. And I think it's important not to uh, overestimate, overweight what the rest of the world brings to the continent. When you consider the financial inflows for development in Africa, is the first source of funding. Uh, we are a continent where we save sort of 20 to 25 percent of the GDP. Let's bear in mind as well that we have a very important contribution of African non-resident in Africa and that one of the key parts of the inflows from abroad are also African with our non-resident fellow citizens. It is as much as public development aid. So, so I think if I hear you correctly, you're yeah. saying that the remittances and the financing of African, um, that's raised from Africans, falls into the basket of South-South cooperation? Yeah, absolutely. And when we speak of, uh, for instance, foreign direct investments, which are quite important, coming from the South or from, from the North, so, Essentially, I don't know if uh, India uh, and China are really southern, but uh, coming from India... They're traditionally from, you know, classified as southern. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> China coming from Brazil, uh, uh, Latin Turkey. America, and so on and so forth. But all our foreign direct investments, which by and large, depending on the years, are something in between 5 and 8% of the continent's GDP. So it is a very important contribution, but it is not the main source of funding. And it is almost associated to partnerships in Africa, and, 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 and I agree. You, you have very rarely 100% investment. So we have to leverage, and we leverage more and more domestic funds with uh, foreign uh, inflows. So again, Africa is the number one contributor to African development. And among... So what you've done actually is you've taken us further down. You've sort of broken up the South into, you know, the, the various continents. And you're telling us that even if we have um, um, partnerships with external, um, you, you know, uh, countries uh, within the fall within the global South, that Africa is still um, the number one contributor to its own development. Yeah. However, or the leverage or the lever. Go down further, um, because it seems the broad basket of South South cooperation includes things like um, military intervention we've mm -hmm. just been hearing, um, D and Rwanda and various others in Somalia. Um, we've heard about um, the exchange um, of um, technology and knowledge, uh, Enola. And so given that you work in the Niger Delta, which um, unfortunately we know is a place of um, you know, conflict and hostility, what lessons would you extrapolate um, for us that we can apply uh, to the continent as Africa you know, looks to leverage its um, South-South partnerships? Right, uh, I'll just break it down in terms of the Niger Delta. Nine oil producing states within the southern part of Nigeria that uh, are, you know, I think it's 
pretty much a, a microcosm of everything that's going on in the world. So climate change issues, uh, governance, corruption, uh, lack of accountability between the populace and other people that are go governing. Um, there is an understanding that, that the Niger Delta produces And the Niger Delta matters for the most populous and, and most um, economic, the uh, la um, largest economic economy in, in Africa, which means that the partnerships we've found have been between kind of strange bedfellows of sorts. The uh, international oil companies, for example, who are essentially benefits, uh, uh, beneficiaries of peace and security, um, as well as some could say, um, you know, with the uh, effects of uh, lack of diversification between, beyond oil and gas, it causes that conflict. So um, we've seen that key partnerships between um, shared um, cities who are, are non-state actors has been really viable, and then involvement of the populace. So you see all of these agendas and, and, and um, cooperative agreements that happen at the supranational or regional level, but how does that really affect the individual on the ground? Um, are Actually, they that's are their question. lives yeah. right? But but in terms of that, the partnerships are, help, are a, if there's there needs to be clarity of vision between the frameworks and the partnerships that are created in order to achieve the kind of success that we need. So in terms then, if if we were looking and we're thinking about the African Union and various other partnerships, um, you know, South South Corporation is taken seriously. It's observed in September. There was a conference in Turkey mm -hmm. um, around that. What can we do to drive the process forward? Um, given your experience of the Niger Delta? I think ownership of exactly what South-South cooperation actually means. Um, we know that it has to go you know, um, very, you know, the Abuja Declaration and others, um, but I think it really means, what does it mean for us? Um, we know the UN definition is technology transfers and knowledge transfers, but we're realizing that it goes way beyond that. Um, we talked about military involvement and others, and I think that Africa has to understand what does South-South cooperation mean within Africa and then with the BRICS and with, uh, with other entities as well. Um, Lionel, who pays for this? Who? Who pays for South-South cooperation? <laughs> uh, again, uh, I think that Africa pays more than what people think, uh, more than what people think. Having said that, it's very important for Africa to have a competition of all the foreign powers, and it's totally new the last 20 years. What do you mean by foreign powers? Because yesterday we talked about foreign powers. Yeah. I showed you that. Um, today we're talking about South-South yeah, cooperation. So, so who, who's competing? So the, the, first, the first South partners are other African partners for each of us. Mm. Second, uh, if you take uh, the Indian subcontinent, if you take uh, Latin America, if you take uh, Brazil, uh, the inflows for the time being are not huge uh, inflows, and they uh, represent, uh, in terms of flows, a growing part, but in terms of stock, clearly, uh, are foreign partners and, uh, and America, so they are uh, northern. But it's essential for Africa to encourage and multiply the partnerships with non-conventional, with new, new partners. Mm -hmm. We have to have a competition. And in the last 20 years, we have started to have a competition of, of, of skills and a competition of funding. If you consider um, the, the, the inflows, even of public aid uh, coming to Africa, not purely foreign direct investments, we have now a significant contribution of non-conventional, not northern countries. And Africa needs this to emulate uh, this, uh, so this competition. So when you say non-conventional, you mean by non-traditional you know, uh, donors and... Exactly. Okay. And so um, what does that look like? Because the uh, complaint in the past has always been that there's an unequal relationship. And so even within um, the global southern countries, we have countries that have bigger economies than others, um, China, India, Brazil, the BRICS countries. Um, and so do we replicate the existing um, relationships that people find problematic? Or what, you know? No, because 
there again, we are at the end of, of, of a cycle. We are. And what cycle is that? We are going. We are entering, I think, in in a process of manufacturing and creating uh, value added. Um, and and it's, it's 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 quite important if you consider this country. This country is exporting less and less raw vegetables and more and more um, uh, components be it in uh, aerospace, be it in the car industry, be it in uh, uh, chips, uh, and so on. So, uh, and it's not only true of Northern Africa and Southern Africa. It starts to become true of all our sub-Saharan uh, economies. So we enter in a cycle of, of value added. So the, the investments we, 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 we favor, we encourage, are dedicated to uh, enrich uh, our export base and create uh, manufacturing jobs and service, uh, service jobs. Okay. Don't uh, um, consider that in Africa. When we speak of transfer of, of skills today and knowledge, uh, consider the, the, the effect of the digital, digital revolution. Consider the mobile payments. We okay. start to franchise our technologies and our software outside of the continent. Okay. And it will be true of the renewable energy as well. Uh, uh, Africa starts to be a pioneer in some niches or in some uh, social usages of technology. So okay. it changes Thank completely you. the relationship. It's fine. So, um, look, we have just 20 minutes to go. If you ha have any questions that you'd like to put the pa to the panel, just raise your hand and we'll come to you. But, Anyola, um, I'll come back to you because um, I'm, I'm still pressing on the question about mm -hmm. Um, the existing model of bigger economies having a bigger voice um, and that still being a problem in, within the existing framework of South-South cooperation. How does one address that? So I'll take it on two sides and, and to pick up on the point that was made around commodities, I, I do challenge that point a bit because I think that, yes, we, we agree in terms of um, not selling your country short in any of those agreements. And any agreement at the end of the day is, a, you know, a collective bargaining. Um, with different countries that have different in interests. And sometimes, I do believe, this is just my own personal opinion, is that um, we take positions, an example is Nigeria, sometimes taking positions that are different from its own populace and maybe its own interests. That could be from a lack of understanding of, of where the drivers of, of development um, are, where the sectors are, or it could be kind of once we get to those conversations at the, at the region. Um, and so there is then to be some trust within that system. I would say that the second piece to that is, is, is directly related to um, creating uh, a, a feedback mechanism between what exactly do these agreements, whether they are within, uh, if they're bilateral agreements or, or uh, you know, multilateral agreements, what does that mean in terms of the business case for the individual countries? And I'm not sure if we're quite there yet because that requires having a clarity of vision of where, where we want to be. Um, at the end of the day, a, a, any kind of cooperation or agreement has to deal with the prosperity and, and security of those involved. And I'm not sure if that connection is fully made. Okay, so let's just take some questions. Laundry, you have a question? If we could get a mic, thank you. Just remember to introduce yourself, not everyone knows you. Landry Signier, uh, Senior Filo at the OCP Policy Center. So I have a couple of questions. The first, uh, intra Africa. Landry, uh, we have 20 minutes to go, so you can't ask a couple of questions. Excellent. Okay, I will you. ask one question then. <laughs> so, how can we uh, enhance intra, uh, intra Africa relations? Uh, we have had many initiatives from uh, the Lagos uh, Plan of Action, uh, NEPA, the African Union, the Continental uh, Free Trade Area, which was supposed to start uh, this year. So moving forward, what could be done uh, based on your personal experience, especially Prime Minister, to enhance uh, enter, enter or enter Africa? But I think it is easy to make huge progress uh, currently. There is a question of connectivity, as Anyola uh, mentioned. But there you have progress of every kind, but maybe the, the, the less visible are the most important. What is done in terms of uh, um, telecom, uh, telecom infrastructure, which has been self-financed by the private sector, essentially, 
has been and remains absolutely key. Uh, so you, you, you have Pan-African companies starting in many service industries and in many consumer goods industries and in many um, building material industries, really. But consider the service industries as being maybe a bit ahead uh, of the game. It's not only and purely a question of tariffs, even if we have progress in this respect. Next March, we will have in terms of free trade in Africa, a sort of historical treaty signed by the heads of state. Again, it is, it is the, 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 the sort of institutional framework, but this framework progresses. But it's not purely a public policy question. It's not a purely a question of creating monetary zones or strengthening the monetary zone. Uh, for instance, yes, it will be a major progress in uh, East Africa to create a monetary zone. Yes, you have some resistance. Uh, yes, you have some anxieties of competition. Many people, they resist against Kenya being too advanced for East Africa or Morocco joining the, the ECOWAS. As a, as a sort of threat, uh, a competitive threat to uh, sub-Saharan okay. economies. Thank you. But Let I would say we have many, many progress in the private sector, not only in the public sector. Okay, place. so I'm reminded that we have 10 minutes to go. Mm -hmm. um, you have a question. If we could get a, a microphone. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually more quick comment rather than a question, but uh, maybe to ask the panel, how Would can you we... you tell us your name? Oh, sorry. Okay. I've been intervening since this morning. Okay. Uh, my name is Mary Marinelli. I'm the country director for the World Bank for the Maghreb, and I used to be the country director for... A quick point to say, how can we actually use this platform to institutionalize this South-South exchange within Africa? This morning at the migration session, I think that it was the chief Nigerian negotiator who was saying, we are looking at you, Europe for the solution, when actually we need to look internally and see what are the solutions that are coming within the continent. Okay. The World Bank did a study very quickly showing that uh, 13 countries in the world managed to have sustained growth over a generation. And within in that uh, list, you have Mauritius, you have uh, Namibia, you have a couple of countries. How can we have the platform to learn from this experience? We've been talking a lot of okay, governance. Thank you. No, no. Uh, again, Th just quickly on minutes. governance. Yeah. Uh, we have one down governance. So it's just to say which kind of platform can we put to facilitate this internal learning? Helps us um, begin to shift conversation to what we do yeah. going forward. And you'll have I would differ with all due respect um, a little bit um, in terms of, in, in answering that question, I, I, I do feel that there need to be uh, countries, economies that are anchors. It's very clear to see that the European Union is somewhat anchored from an economic perspective from Germany. And, and there are maybe other countries as well. So I think that kind of cooperation and understanding that there can be an anchoring potentially in Africa of the Moroccos, the Nigerias, the Kenyans, and, and South Africa, the, the larger economies, which then are very simply, in terms of, in terms of their configuration, are the anchors within their, their particular zones or uh, sub-regional zones. I would also think about going beyond the kind of state, state talking earlier, I believe, on the special uh, economic zones and others, because those are clusters of growth that help us think ab about driving in private sector who doesn't think about a country to country strategy, but thinks about these corridors and opportunities. So I think going along with the, the general um, practicality of things will help us bring these kind of high level agreements and, and cooperation cooperative agreements down into what really happens in terms of implementation. So some of what you're saying, and you're now already happens, I think we've right. got um, various regional centers of excellence mm -hmm. um, within the existing uh, regional, the Rex, the regional economic uh, communities. Now, if we were to drive that forward, um, taking the, and projecting into the next 20 years, how do we institutionalize um, some of these initiatives we're seeing within the um, broader context of South-South cooperation? Um, you know, which way is, which way is the um, knowledge and technical expertise being transferred? What should, what, what should it look what? like? Yes, yes. <laughs> what should it look like? Um, what I hope it would look like is, is more funding in terms of specific areas and so of, who's funding? of focus. Funding so is such that, a... that is a good point. Um, you know, a lot, uh, there is a significant 
portion from the member from the member states, but that's not enough because the issues that we deal with in terms of infrastructure, climate change, and all of the things were, that are within the agenda go beyond just the funding by, by individual governments. So how do we bring in the private sector and private um, investment into that? To, for that uh, first off, to get that buy-in. Um, so I, tying in the private sector liaisons with those um, economic uh, zones, uh, uh, regional, um, regional bodies um, would be valuable with ECOWAS. I think we're not even there yet in terms of our, the potential um, for, for a region that I, I'm particularly involved in. Okay, so we've got just less than three minutes to go. Let me just check that there are no questions. May um, I just comment one comment? I, I, I want to come to you with a question just yeah. before <laughs> we, we, we close. Okay, so look, um, you, you want to comment, but I also want to ask you a question. So respond to both. Um, we have seen examples of African clarity, um, you know, common agricultural position, common position on climate change, uh, common position, common negotiation, uh, negotiating position on sustainable development and financing. Um, why, why takes us back? Let's 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 go forward. And others that um, we finance our development more so than others, even though we don't get the credit for it. So, how would you see the South South Corporation working, taking it forward, even with the um, anchor countries and corridors of opportunity, like Enola says? Yeah, uh, and also your question, and uh, my comment is that um, I understand why, um, as a good Nigerian citizen, you see Nigeria as an anchor country, and you say, without anchor countries and plat to create a platform, it will be difficult to build. Look, we have some smaller countries like Mauritius, like Rwanda, which but can yes. play a very important uh, role. Second, uh, the geography is misleading. Mm -hmm. I think personally that the country and even qualitatively, in qualitative terms, is a country which starts in Lagos and stops in Abidjan. And I think it's very, very important to take uh, into account the fact that the geography is not everything. The political uh, borders, all that is very interesting, but you have there all the conditions to create a platform to attract a lot of interest of, of investors. Plus you have this, the role of cities. The, 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 the countries are something very important, but I think that Lagos is more important than many countries uh, in, in West Africa, like Abidjan and so on. So I would say uh, the concepts of what is attractive is Benin as important as Nigeria, because the question has an obvious answer, okay? It's but a colonial country. It could be that Nigeria is a difficult proposition, but a, a more credible proposition. But it's not Nigeria as a whole. It is a corridor in this case. It is this coastline. And in, in, we have to see our geography with a different uh, sort of uh, look at, at, our, at, our, at our geography, I think. Having said that, going, going, going forward, I think that we have to um, uh, multiply the exchanges with countries with, the, with pertinent experience. I was in Argentina in the University of Buenos Aires and we were exchanging on how to finance uh, the uh, guarantee and de-risking system with the experience of the Latin American uh, development banks. I mean, there is nothing more pertinent for us than that. Speaking with uh, Rajiv Lal, the head of uh, the Infrastructure Bank of India, you have nothing more pertinent than a permanent way of exchanging in terms of public policies or technologies with the Indian subcontinent, which is probably what is the most similar mm -hmm. with us in, in terms of ex historical experience. Okay. And I think that our policymakers today are very much more aware of that, that the traditional historical links, we export technologies in a digital world where transfer of knowledge are completely different because everywhere in the remotest part of Benin, you have the possibility to access to knowledge and technology in conditions which are totally different from what it was 20 years ago. There's quite a bit in that response. I have to wind up now because we're out of time and I've been under um, immense pressure from the back of the room to uh, wrap this up. But very quickly, in one word, 
there's been t um, technological transfers, there's been different lenses, there's been re-looking at um, you know, um, various opportunities and geography. One thing that we should do as a matter of urgency to advance South-South cooperation. Focusing on execution and mm -hmm. delivery of this relationship. Thank you. And the other thing I'll add to that is alignment different levels and, and uh, in, of engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I'd also like us to thank our panelists, Enola Mafe and the former Prime Minister of Benin, Lionel Zunzo. Thank you. <laughs>